Well, tonight, when willing, I'll finish up what I began last week in the afternoon about politics. Why not? Some say religion and politics don't mix. Someone, the late Jerry Falwell, said that religion and politics don't mi mix is a lie invented by the devil to keep Christians from running their own government. Now, there are a lot of things that uh, the Reverend late Jerry Falwell did that I could not do, would not agree with, but I agree with that statement. Some say, well, Pastor, we don't want politics at church. Fair enough. So if you want to leave, you can leave now. <laughs> Doreen, stay where you're at. <laughs> we live in strange times. Does it not seem that way? Commissioner Haskell this morning mentioned how because of the lack of ability to go as much door-to-door, -door, they've been doing more mailings and calling. Has anybody been a beneficiary of those mailings or phone calls or text messages? My phone has blown up. It seems that I cannot go more than a couple of hours and I don't get a text reminding me to vote and who I should vote for. Apparently, I'm on two different lists right now. One is conservative-leaning. The other one is liberal-leaning. And so I get information on both sides right now on who I should vote for. So between both of those lists that somehow I got on, and maybe one of you was, was helpful, so bless your heart for that. <laughs> I'll give you some ideas now. I am a constantly, it seems, every hour or so, on my text messages, clicking report spam, report spam, report spam, report spam, and report spam. I have occasion to go on to the video sharing site called YouTube. Maybe you've been on YouTube before as well. It seems that right now I cannot watch a video on how to wire something electrically without having two, not just one, two political videos that you can barely skip. And it gets heavy and tedious and burdensome, does it not? It seems that it is as if every day for the past couple weeks, you go to the mailbox, and there are these large placards, right? Gloss covered. More money than we've ever spent here at First Baptist Church on something, right? And just document after document that I don't even look at or glance at. They go straight from my hand, the gloss field, right into the uh, trash receptacle. I try to avoid as much of social media as I can. All right, and now there are varying degrees of this in the world. There's, of course, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Pinterest. That one I do a good job of avoiding altogether. My wife, not so much. And you men, if you have a Pinterest, if you have a board, Pinterest board, shame on you men. Shame on you. All right? At the end, I'll give an invitation. I expect to see you up here. All right? With your Pinterest open on your phone, you begging God to forgive you for that. If you pin things you like, man, I tell you what. It's a shame. It's a shame. It ought to be in the Bible if it's not. Just my opinion, right? But I try to avoid social media, but it's, it's around us, right? And we use it at church. We use it for Facebook Live. Some of you are on there tonight as well. We use it to update events. And so I'm, I'm on there. I'm on there occasionally, right? It seems that, though, is if I pull up Facebook on my daily lurk on Facebook, I would be a lurker on Facebook. Um, that's one who looks at what everyone else does, right? And find out what you're doing with your life. And uh, as I lurk on there, it begins with political ads, and in the middle of it, there's political ads. At the end, there's political ads. And, and then in the middle, there's posts from people I know about political things, too. Seems like I can't get away from it. And sometimes it can weigh a little bit on me because it seems as if some Christians have turned off their Christianity when it comes to politics. They're good Christians on Sunday, but uh, I'm not sure on Monday. Now, that can be true for a lot of us for a lot of different reasons, but tonight the focus is politics. For some, or for, ah, for, for some, after Tuesday, life will be over. 
Well, no matter what side you fall on, right? Those who are conservative, if President Trump does not get reelected, their life will be over if we even find out Tuesday. Could be a month or two or more, right? For those who are uh, perhaps leading toward a uh, vote for President or, or Vice President Biden, if he doesn't get elected, their life will be over. I mean, just everything's there. And, and I tell you what, I'm glad to be able to proclaim that on Wednesday morning, I am still a servant of Jesus Christ. Uh, with God's grace that I can wake up Wednesday morning and not be like in the Bible when they woke up dead, all right? But, but by God's grace on Wednesday morning when I wake up, I'll still be a father and a husband and a pastor and a Christian. And, and, I, and I want to live for God on Wednesday morning no matter whom is in the White House. Because I'm called to something, you are called to something bigger than the election. Last week, I proposed this idea that we ought to live a life that is light-focused. So Paul says in Ephesians, you are children of the light. Walk in the light. Live a life that is light-focused. All right, I don't mean because you have flashlights. I'm a flashlight lover. I have a number of flashlights. Recently, Pastor Lett gave me another flashlight. And he said something very foolish. Pastor Lett does not say very many foolish things. But he said something to me that was foolish. He said, if you don't need it. <laughs> if I don't need it. Since when was that the criteria for getting another flashlight? <laughs> That's not the criteria. If it works, I need it. I need it. I How can I live without it? Say, Pastor, where do you have flashlights? Yes, yes. In the car, multiple ones in the car. In my wife's car, in the other place, in the garage, and right next to the garage, in the basement, and next to the basement, and in my bedroom, in this door, in this door, and in the pole barn. They're, they're everywhere. So that when I need the light, I can have it. So I don't have to stumble around in the darkness like you poor folk who make fun of my flashlight addiction. <laughs> yeah, we have the light from God's Word. How available is it to you? How have you made it available? We're supposed to live a light-focused life, and I've challenged us to vote with a light-focused vote. You see, I've observed that Christians have been sidetracked with the world's philosophies especially, it seems, when it comes to politics. Now, some will say, well, Pastor, I don't think you're allowed to mention politics when you preach. Look at the law. I can. What I cannot do is tell you who to vote for while I preach. If I'm not preaching, I can say anything I want to say. So if I stop preaching halfway through, just forgive me, and we'll pick back up later on. No, no. <laughs> I heard a Christian say this, well, I'm not going to vote for President Trump because I don't like his personality. Now, hold on a moment. I don't, I don't care right now whether you're liberal, conservative, whether you want to vote for, pre for Vice President Biden or President Trump. What I care about is how we come to that conclusion. Some, well, he, they went on to say he's a bully. He's a jerk, and he's rude. And I agree with them. Sorry. I have heard two different testimonies of a salvation testimony from President Trump. Two, two, different, two different sources of a salvation testimony. I hope, and I pray for our president, I hope him to be saved. I have a fairly good confidence in Vice President Pence being saved. I have a friend who is often in the Wednesday morning Bible study in his office. All right, but President Trump, I don't know if he's saved or not. If he is saved, all right, he is a very young, immature Christian. He needs to grow in grace. He ought to read the, the part about walking in the Spirit. Like I would tell to anybody who's a new Christian who ran their mouth like that, I'd say, listen, you need to walk in the Spirit today. Right? Can, can I get an amen? All right, you know. Uh, but I'm not giving him a pass. But I don't think he makes all the right decisions but isn't it bigger than personality? Or shouldn't it be a little bit bigger than personality? Now, we, we can use that as, as a criteria, but is that the only criteria? Someone else 
Well, I'm voting for this candidate because of the tax breaks I will get. Now listen, I am all for tax breaks. I don't want to pay more taxes in my life, and I don't think you do either. And given the choice, I will vote for less taxes in my life. But isn't life supposed to be a little bit bigger? Isn't, if I walk in the light, it's a little bit bigger than a tax break? In fact, my Bible talks about taxes. It, well, last time I checked, when Jesus talked about taxes, he said, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, or I ought to be honest on my taxes. The Bible talks about honesty on their taxes. And if you're not honest on your taxes, there is no loophole for you. That's in the Bible. You can't say I interpret it differently or it's my own opinion. That's what Jesus said. He went on when they were charged for taxes to send Peter fishing to catch a fish with a coin in the mouth. Jesus paid taxes. You, you can't get that one. There was a Christian a few years back who was trying to argue that he'd have to pay taxes because he was a citizen of God's kingdom. Read your Bible. I mean, th this is not rocket science. This is not looking back at the Greek. Th this is just read your Bible. But, but it's bigger than that. I mentioned last week, but I'll mention it again. There are some <clears throat> who view of gun rights, and I am all support of the Second Amendment. All right, I don't have as many guns as some. I have more than others. Some of you, uh, your last gun purchase was the one that's not en enough. You need another one, another one, another one, and, and you like like I have like flashlights. I like guns. All right, I am pro gun. I have a concealed pistol license. All right, I'm not carrying right now. All right, don't worry, don't worry. But if they if they take away my gun rights. I can still be a citizen for Jesus Christ. Last time I checked, the right to bear arms was not in the Bible. And yet there are some Christians, Christians who would view the right to bear arms above, above their love for God. You say, oh, pastor, you're making that up. I'm not making this up. I'm not. Christians who would say, listen, they come to take my guns, I'll shoot them. So murder's okay. Murder is okay. If they come now, once again, don't misunderstand me. I am for the right to bear arms and the right to have guns, all right? I think it's protected in our constitution. All right? I think it's there. I think they ought to vote for that. But but that's not the biggest thing. You see, I cannot overlook some core values and core ideas. And here is where the philosophy has infiltrated our Christian minds, where someone says this, Well, Pastor, you and I just view it differently. Now watch with me and think about this little phrase, you and I view it differently. We just view things differently. As if all these decisions and all the way I live and all the way that I walk in this light is merely my own viewpoint. In the world, in our society, individuals' views are important. Children, we're taught to tell children that they do a good job. Kind of the participation idea. Good job for effort. You did great you tried hard, boy, and that answer was really close. Two plus two being six, that, boy, that's right, all right? And here's a smiley face, but next time, let's draw the six like this so it looks like a four. And those are good ideas you have. Boy, those are valid ideas. You see this right now playing out. We have a generation that has been raised like this. And now everyone gets to spout their view on social media, right? And everyone's view is equally valid. This is a worldly philosophy. That, that, that my view is just a view, it's equally valid, as if all we operate on our views are our own perspectives. Now, we all have some views. I like coffee. All right, thank you, thank you. All right, and those of you men who after you pray for forgiveness on Pinterest, all right, pray for forgiveness for coffee, this side over here, no. But coffee is a preference in a view, right? We can understand that. It doesn't matter if you like it or don't like it, right? We can tease about it. You can say, I, it doesn't matter, right? Who cares? 
It would matter if I got up here and say, well, God says, you know, true Christians drink coffee. It's in the Bible, Hebrews. <laughs> that would be a problem. That would be a problem. But coffee, things like that doesn't matter. I don't care what, what color vehicle you drive, right? That is a view. That's a preference. But there are some things that are not. And the issue is it's not just about views. It's about God's Word. If you have your Bibles, turn now to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, Paul pen, has penned these words through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in verse number 20. I am crucified with Christ. You see that there? I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And here's the key to the next phrase. And the life which I now live in the flesh. Take your hand tonight and pinch your hand, if you would, please. Pinch it, all right? Pinch it, all right? Go ahead. Or if not, pinch the person next to you. I don't care. Ouch. Oh, ah, all right. That's the flesh. He says, the life that I now live in the flesh. That's the flesh. Hands, feet, our minds. This is the flesh that we live in. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ. When he was crucified on that cross, I have submitted myself to that crucifixion. My sins, my past were crucified there. And, and it's not me that lives, it's Christ that lives. That's why he would go on to say this, for, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But he says, the life that I now live, I live by the faith the Son of God. There's a different criteria. There's a different value system. There's a different perspective. And it's not my perspective, but it's His perspective. You see, too many Christians only operate on their own views and values instead of operating on God's views and God's values. What does God think about coffee? What does God think about Pinterest? And what does God think about my vote? Turn over, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. Verse number 19 and 20, Paul says, What know ye not that your body is the temple of of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore, that word therefore, because of what I have just explained to you, therefore, this is the response you should have. All right, because your body is not your own, because the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost of God dwells inside of you, because you've been bought with a price, all right, therefore, so because of those factors, because of those reasons, therefore, here is a response you must have or ought to have, therefore, glorify God in your body, this is the body, the flesh, and your spirit, which are God's. So this vote, it's not my vote, is it? It's his vote. These hands, they're not my hands, are they? They're his hands. This mind, as odd, weird, crazy, or logical as it may be in all our cases, is not my mind. It's supposed to be his mind. But the finances that I may have or may wish I have are not mine. They're his. The house is his house. My children, which are a heritage of the Lord, are, are his children. All these things, therefore, therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So we approach 
this election. I challenge you to approach it with God's view. With what God thinks. There are a number of ways we could go with this, but I'm going to go with just one tonight. It's all I have time for. I wish I had more, and maybe in years to come I'll give more. But I want to talk about just one issue that is clearly addressed from God's Word. That is clearly given to us. That for some reason, and I don't quite understand why, Christians, it seems, have begun to push down this issue a little bit. And based on what polls say and, and the current polls, it comes from the younger generation. And that is the issue of the sanctity of life, the abortion issue. Pro-life, pro-choice. Does it matter if I vote a certain way? And the answer is a resounding yes. It absolutely does. I'll tell you right now that I believe the way that God presents the issue of life, that I cannot support someone who does not support life. I do not care what their social programs may be. I do not care what their gun rights ideas may be. I do not care what their personality may or may not be. This issue of life and the sanctity of life is a biblical core issue. Now, given the choice, I'll take all these things as well. Don't, don't, don't miss my point. If I can have my cake and eat it too, I surely will. But I must support those who support life. Let's look at it from God's Word tonight, if we can. The sanctity of life. I have a couple of statistics, but I don't want to bring statistics because I'm not trying to have a pro-life, pro-choice debate. It's not the purpose of this. I'm not trying to just use apologetics and the reasons why, and, and, and though those things are helpful. I'm not against those things. I've watched a number of these debates, apologetics or reasoning for pro-life, and I think they have their place and they're helpful. But tonight, I want us to be reminded from God's Word why it's a big deal. Because if I'm not my own and God says it's a big deal, then that aside, it ought to be a big deal. It ought to be mentioned, though, that they say that one out of every three Babies conceived in America is aborted. The numbers I have here are that there are 1.6 million abortions reported in this country every year. Every year. Showing that since 1973, Roe v. Wade, over 40 million. I don't know how a Christian can look at this and say, well, you know what, the abortion thing, uh, he, well, you know, they're a good person, they're just, they're just kind of pro-choice. Oh, hold on. Let's look at God's Word, if you would. Three quick points, and I will not, well, I'd say it won't be long, but we don't know where we'll go tonight. Look, if you would, turn to Genesis chapter number 2, if you would. Let's start at the beginning, Genesis chapter number 2. Remember these three keys. Number one, God is the author of life. God is the author of all life. God began this. In Revelation, he's, uh, Jesus is called the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end, in case you miss it. He is the author and the finisher. God is the author of life. In Genesis chapter number one, we have the creation account, not the creation story. It's not a fairy tale. It actually happened. God did that. He spoke it into existence. And all life came upon earth because of God's word. We find out in the New Testament that it was Jesus who actually did that. It makes perfect sense. The verse number one of Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. But he spoke and Jesus is called the word. And so Jesus actually did these things. He authored life, life in the trees, life in the plants, 
life in the sea, life in the animals. All life came from God. God is the author of life. But then beyond that, in chapter 2 and verse number 7, the Bible says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. You and I are not here by accident. We are here because God, God, in his providence, in his mercy and compassion, after he created the entire world and the universe, came down to this earth, all right, and he formed man. The, the word form there, the idea of his hands forming man, not just his voice. With his voice, he created all the beautiful things we see in the stars that we cannot recreate and cannot understand in many ways. And all the, the intricacies of this creation in this world. And every day, they discover new things and new, and new animals and plants and just different species. It's amazing. It's unbelievable. And yet for man, God formed him with the idea that he used his hands not just his voice. Made him just like he wanted him to be. He didn't just say, let there be life. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. You and I are not the author of life. The scientists are not the author of life. We have not even recreated life. There's a story that is told but a scientist who said to God, Lord, we don't need you anymore. We figured out a way to create life out of nothing. In other words, the scientist said, we can do what you did in the beginning. Oh, is that so? The Lord said, tell me more. Well, says the scientist, well, we take some dirt and breathe. And, and, and the Lord said, hold on, hold on, hold on. Get your own dirt. By the way, get your own universe and your own laws of physics and everything else because I did it all. And we have in our minds the idea somehow because we've been blinded by sin and, and people who are unsaved are blinded by Satan and blinded by selfishness that this life, is, it's all about me. And the life of an unborn child, not just an embryo or, or something that's coming along, but an unborn child, that, that is in my hands and my hands alone. And if it, if it pleases me to keep the child, then I can. And if it doesn't, I ought to have the right to not carry the child if I don't want to. God is the author of life. I read that a few years back, they took a poll. One of the states, they took a poll about abortions. In this particular survey, they said that the folks who answered that 1% would choose to have an abortion, 1% of the ones who responded would choose to have an abortion if they didn't like the gender of their child. And that 11% would choose to have an abortion and murder their baby if they found out the child was predisposed to obesity. I read another such statistic that said I believe it was around 70 or 50 to 70 percent of all abortions were not because of circumstances through rape or incest but because of inconvenience to life. This child will mess up my life too much. God is the author of life. I didn't make life. You didn't make life. So what gives us the right to just decide to end it? Second thought is this. Not only is God the author of life, God is the giver of new life. Psalm 139. Turn there if you would, please. Psalm 139. Verse 13, the writer says this, For thou, that is God, hast possessed me of my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. 
Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee. When I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, thine eyes did see my substance yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! Each person uniquely fashioned. Each person uniquely gifted. Each person uniquely blessed. And the psalmist says that all of this begins in the mother's womb. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. We spend most of our lives changing the way we were made. Adding a little bit of this and hiding a little bit of that. Eating this and not that. And wearing this and not that. And lifting this and hoping to change that. But the fact is we are wondrously and fearfully made from the giver of new life. I'm blessed to have three children here. My wife had a miscarriage in between two, and we believe that child is in heaven. In fact, we, the kids named that baby. Should I say the name? Yeah, so the kids were very young, but they named that child Sparkle Pumpkin. Huh. Wait, hold on. Hold on. You think your names are normal? Read the Bible. Those are the most normal. I mean, you think your names are normal? <laughs> Please. I got a Bible named John, all right? So I'm good. Sparkle Pumpkin. Maybe Danielle named Sparkle Pumpkin. They're all pointing at each other. Someone else named it. They're small, and they used to pray for that little child. You know what? Probably one day we'll see him again, or her again. We don't know. It was too early to know the gender at that point. The other day, it was it Saturday? But the Clarence, it's Brittany had their gender reveal party, right? And they're having a young man. Hopefully they won't have an old man, just a young man they'll have. <laughs> and he'll live to be an old man. Wonderful thing. Wife and I were at uh, the Lamaze, the Le, what is that class? Lamaze? Le, yeah, Lamaze class. We went to one of those. <clears throat> one of those. My wife dragged me there. And I... Uh, they're going around the room introducing themselves, and my wife was noticeably pregnant. All right? My wife became noticeably pregnant as she was pregnant. That happens, right? You can never ask, but you can tell, usually. We're there and introducing themselves, and it seemed as if all the ladies were introducing themselves. Hi, my name is, you know, Jane, and, and this is my husband, and, and we're having a, you know, a boy or a girl. And I was like, oh, that's neat. What do you do? That's, that's special. So I said, honey, I got this. <laughs> I got this. I can introduce myself. I'm, I'm, you know, I, I'm happy to speak in public. I'm not afraid of that. And I and, uh, said, hi, my name is J.D. This is my wife, Doreen. I said, I'm here because my wife dragged me here and said, get yourself off the couch. <laughs> that bought me, I think, a jab in the side. And, uh, you know, all the men were like, yeah. <laughs> and my wife said, I did not do that. And she, you know, and I said, and uh, we don't know what we're having, but it may be a heifer. We didn't. We didn't. We didn't know it was a boy or girl at that point, and that bought me another jab and another, and then it also bought me no more invitations to those classes. <laughs> you man, I'm smarter than I look sometimes. You're like I can never get away with that. Well, you don't know till you try. <laughs> and you know what? Just on a side note, she breathed just fine. I had the baby. She breathed just fine. She even breathing her whole life. <laughs> you know, breathing her whole life. I don't know what I could do to help her, but. Uh, and then Johnny was born unique, James, Danielle, unique. God, the giver of new life. And who am I? Who am I, reading Psalm 139, to look at that and say, well, you know what, it doesn't really matter. If I'm inconvenienced, according to Psalm 139, if I'm inconvenienced in my life, well, that's okay. No, 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 I read Psalm 139, and I see that God has a plan already for this child for this person. 
a wonderful plan, a, a fearful, meaning marvelous plan. And, and, and who am I to sit there and think and, and be so emboldened, so, so brazen to say, well, you know what? I don't want to mess up my plans for my life. I can't be inconvenienced with what, I, with what I have going on. So God, whatever you're doing that's fearfully and wonderful is going to take a back seat to what I want to do. How proud, how pagan that is. I can't imagine life without the three little kids I've got running around the house. Oh, there were times. There are times. There are times. Moms and dads, you know this. There are times. There are times. It's bedtime, kids. Dad, it's 4 o'clock. Yep, that's right. It's bedtime. And I'm going to bed. I'm wore out. Last is this. Not only does God, the author of life, the giver of new life, God sustains all life. Colossians 1, verse 17. Jesus and he is before all things, and by him... All things consist. Every moment or every breath is a gift from God. I am here because of God's gracious gift. In fact, my name, John, means God's gracious gift. Reminder of what God has done. As I walk with God, I will not live in my walk with God one moment longer or die one moment sooner than he wants me to. Yet, I do have the ability to shorten life. I do. God has, in his will, in his plan, in his way, designed this, that he has given us the ability to shorten life. In the Old Testament, they called it shedding of innocent blood. We call it murder. And yet they would have us to believe that it's not murder, it's not shedding of innocent blood, it is just a choice. A choice. I'm about out of time now and I have so many more pages of notes. It seems as if you talk to someone who is pro-choice, they'll often give a situation like this. Well, imagine a young, unwed mother, young girl, call her 13 years old, She's in this circumstance because of just a terrible life situation and she was perhaps accosted by some very bad men or man. And now she has no way to support this child. And there's diseases there and, and there's the health, her health. What, do we, what should we do in that situation? I'll just give you this as, as a help. Remember this in that time. That a situation does not change truth. Usually in this particular scenario, the situation is always painted very badly. I would suggest if that's the situation, let's make it even worse. All right? She's a quadriplegic. Stage four cancer. If it's going to be bad, make it as bad as it can be, right? She's blind. She cannot, uh, she cannot speak. And she's deaf. Now, I'm not being in jest. I'm just saying, if you're going to paint a scenario, you might as well go all the way. Because if it's bad, it's really bad. But a situation cannot change and should not change the truth in question. Truth is truth regardless of situations. And abortion is still the direct killing of innocent human beings. We would not vote for genocide, nor would we vote for a serial killer. Yet Christians would vote for pro-choice. And I believe that is on the same level. Abortion is still the direct killing of innocent human beings. Abortion is still murder. And God is still against it. And my faith does not allow me to support the killing of children. And I pray that your faith doesn't either. If someone were to walk in tonight, heaven forbid and start to attack the children. I don't think there's anyone in this room who would not do everything they could to stop the situation for our children. Would we not, any of us, 
For the children, we would do that in a moment. Mothers, with their, their strong love for their children, will do countless things. I cannot vote pro choice. And I cannot vote for people who are pro choice because God is the author of life, the giver of new life, and God sustains life, and God is in charge of life, not me. See, God's a creator. We have inherent value and worth. We're all created equal. I'll end with this story. Stories from a pastor. He had two members in his church, Tom and his wife. Now, let me just, I should pause before I finish the sermon here and say this. I meant to say this earlier. If, if in your life you've had an abortion, okay, and you realize mistake or whatnot, know this. That you can always find forgiveness in Jesus Christ. And if you come to me and, and, and you were to say, Pastor, I made a, a mistake like that, I'm not going to stand up here and lambast you. All right? I will show you nothing but love, grace, and forgiveness just like God does. It, it, don't, please, I meant to say this earlier. I, I don't want to get off track too far, but, but don't mistake my strong stance for who I, whom I can vote for and who I have to uh, because of God's word. The, the, but the acknowledgement that at times we all make mistakes and some are bad mistakes all right some are mistakes like you turn left says turn right but some are bad mistakes but last time I checked I'm allowed to bring my mistakes to Jesus and he cleanses me from all sin not just the little ones or the medium-sized one but even the big ones and so if that's even you tonight I don't for a moment want you to think, oh no, a pastor is going to hate me and God's going to hate me. Absolutely not. You find nothing at the cross but love and forgiveness and compassion and mercy and grace. But that being said, I still can't vote pro-choice. Tom and his wife were vibrant active Christians. They held positions in the church, this pastor. He was a teacher, and a choir member, so was she. But then their eldest daughter became pregnant in a wrong relationship, still in high school. Found out, apparently, when the planned parenthood material came to the house. And the mother asked the daughter, and then the whole story came out. The pastor who was talking about this said that he sat down with Tom and his wife who were humiliated at, at what has taken place and as a parent you would be saddened and, and probably a little bit embarrassed as well. The realization that their teaching, their example had been somewhat ignored and the years of spiritual training for the daughter had been thrust aside. And the pastor asked Tom, well, what have you decided to do? Would you keep the baby or put it up for adoption? And the pastor said that Tom paused for a long moment and then said, well, it was a hard decision. We weighed the options, but we made the appointment at the abortion clinic. And I drove my daughter down there herself. The pastor um, was struck. This man has been outspoken against abortion for years. And then the pastor said this. This is why I tell you this story. He said that Tom made a statement that captured the essence of the problem. He said, and here was a statement, I know what I believe, pastor, he used the pastor's name, but that's different than what I had to do. And that's the problem that we face. We know what we believe, but sometimes we think we have to do differently. My challenge for you, you're not your own. I'm not my own. Vote by the faith in God. And I believe it clearly means I have to support pro-life 
I don't have a choice. And if I wanted to choose different, I can't. Because these hands, they're not my hands. This mind, not my mind. This life is not my life to live. It's his life. And I hope you vote by Tuesday. You can vote before Tuesday. You ought to vote. Get out there and vote. Don't miss this election. Don't miss it. As important of one as I can ever remember. Don't miss it. But for sure, but for sure, don't waste it. Don't waste it. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for what you've given to each one of us, this life we have to live. So gracious to me, to my family, Lord, to this church. What a marvelous place that I get to serve here. Lord, may we not miss what you've called us to. Lord, we're called as your children. And Lord, I'm not my own. You bought me with a price. Lord, help me to glorify you. Just one, we'll stand and we'll pray. A little different sermon tonight. But if the Lord touched your heart, you're welcome to come and pray. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I encourage you to come and we'd love to open a Bible and show you how you can know for sure that God loves you and Jesus died for you. If you want someone to pray with you, we'll have pastors up front. Lord, bless this time now in Jesus' name. As you stand to our feet, the piano's playing. With a great song, I have decided to follow Jesus. Sing that with me now. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me. The cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, though no one join me, still I will follow. dying for us. Thank you for saving us, Lord. Thank you for loving us, for your patience and grace. Lord, I pray for this election in our country. Lord, I pray for your grace and your help during this time. Lord, I pray for Christians, that we would do our part, that we would vote, Lord, but that we'd be informed, but that we'd be informed according to your word as well. Lord, we love you. Thank you for letting us be here in America. Bless this time and this week in Jesus' name. Amen.